Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to get ready to hold them up if you would. And when you hold them up today, say these words with me, the Word of the Lord. Would you hold them up today and say, the Word of the Lord. We ought, we ought to say the Word of the Lord again. One, two, three. Amen. Amen. I know you believe it. Say it like you mean it. We'll just get the timing right. Matthew chapter 6 today. Matthew chapter 6 beginning in verse 24. Matthew chapter 6 beginning in verse 24. As I said a moment ago, I'm so happy about the weather being good for the first time in a number of weeks. Last, last week, it was ominous. The threats of rain were, uh, were pretty uh, intimidating, apparently, because even the airport canceled flight after flight after flight. And as we know now, the weather went south to Houston where there was a uh, tremendous downpour and lots of tragedy going on there. Well, my wife and I were supposed to fly out last Sunday afternoon about 3 o'clock for a conference. Uh, it didn't hurt that the conference was in Florida. It didn't hurt that it was near a beach. And so we were excited about that. And uh, the conference began Sunday night and uh, ran through uh, Wednesday. And so they canceled our flight. My wife and I uh, got word that the, the plane was canceled at 3 o'clock. And, uh, and so it was about 5 or 6 o'clock uh, before we started getting communication about when it would actually be. Actually, about 4 o'clock, they told us they would, they would rebook us for Monday night at 8, 8, 8 p.m., all right? Not Monday morning, but Monday night at 8 p.m. And we took one look at each other and thought, you know what? We're, we're not going to miss a day and a half of sunshine and beach and good conference. We're not going to miss that. And having no kids at home, we said, let's get in the car and go. It was a totally impromptu decision to get in the car and drive 11 hours. And guess what? It never rained back here at Dallas-Fort Worth after that plane was canceled. Now, the great news about it is we got there at 3 in the morning, had a wonderful time together all during the week, didn't miss much of the conference at all. And then it, the, the gnawing feeling in my heart began to sink in that we have to drive back now because we drove down there. We had a wonderful time this last week in, in Florida. Happy for a beautiful day today. Today, we're going to be talking about what it means to be financially faithful or financially wise. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at this this theme upside down, what was it about New Testament believers that caused them to be called Christians, followers of Christ, or those who have turned the world upside down? That's what outsiders called these people that we know as the church of Jesus Christ today. They were called all those, all those words, Christians, followers of the way, those who turn the world upside down. And as we begin to look in the life of disciples, and the characteristics in their lives, we've identified seven characteristics that are common among those who follow Christ. It's important to define what a disciple is. It's important to define what the lifestyle of someone who follows Christ is all about. And so far, we've looked at four of them. We've looked at the fact that followers of Jesus are, first of all, passionately committed to the person of Christ. That's the first thing we looked at. Secondly, we looked at the fact that they were socially concerned. They were concerned about their culture, concerned about the people that lived around them. Thirdly, they were evangelistically bold. They were not willing to hold back and be quiet about the gospel that changed their life. And so they told people everywhere about Jesus Christ. Last week, we looked at the fact that New Testament believers were biblically measured. They measured their lives by the Word of God, by the reveal the revealed Word of God by the Scripture of the Old Testament and as the New Testament was given, New Testament believers came together and said, we will measure our lives by what the Bible says, not by culture, but by what the Bible says. You realize today the pressure on every person, including Christians, to conform to the image of our world. But the Bible tells us that we as believers are to conform to the image of Jesus instead of the image of the world. And being biblically measured is the only thing that keeps us in line and in tune with the characteristics of God. It's so incredibly important to remember that at that moment of salvation, we began a journey towards sanctification. And the Bible is what is in the middle of that journey. And the more devoted we are to the Word of God, the more devoted we are to the sanctification of the Spirit in our lives that causes us to become like Jesus Christ. So we're biblically measured. But the way we live is also affected and revealed by what we do with our money. In Matthew chapter 6, the Bible gives us the words of Jesus as he talks about money, anxiety, worry, trust, and priorities. 
Let's stand together as we read God's Word beginning in verse 24 of Matthew chapter 6. An incredibly famous, often quoted passage following Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. In verse 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And for this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life. As to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon, in all of his glory, clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. But, and here's the principle that Jesus coalesced all this around. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And then the conclusion, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Wouldn't you say amen to that? Each day has enough trouble of its own. Father, today we ask you to take your word, apply it to our lives. We pray that you reveal, illuminate. Father, help us see it as a plumb line for our lives. And today when it comes to money, help us to evaluate where we stand with that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, I'm Tim Alba. Hi, I'm Anna Alba. Well, I've been here at the church for four years, but before that, I was uh, working in corporate for about 30. Literally, my whole career has been about working with someone else's money, being a steward of what someone else has entrusted to me. I mean, really, the way that we're otherwise we're making decisions with money here at the church is really about how do you maximize the effect of, of, of the donations that our people give. It's, it's taking everything that they do and saying, what's the best way to maximize our mission, to otherwise impact lives, to touch the lives of the people, not only in this church, but other community. Being financially faithful isn't something you do some later point in time in life. It's what you do today. It's what you lead your kids to do. It's what you do when you're nine, or you're 29, or you're 89. It, it's, a, it's a way of life. It's not something you do because you take on a different role. Uh, one of the things I've been saying forever to our kids, as they've heard this all, all the time, is, we're never going to live up to our means. Because most of the time you hear you shouldn't live beyond your means. I think that's wrong. The real issue is never live up to your means, meaning that you always allow margin. And, why, and margin is so important because it allows you to bless somebody else. The rewards of being financially faithful are many. All you have to do is walk around our campus and you see our preschoolers, our children, our students, the impact they have in all of their areas. When I see new families come to our church. When I see um, and hear reports of our mission trips, I know that my financial faithfulness through tithing and giving to the church, that's the reaping of it. Yeah, being financially faithful is, uh, it does involve tithing, but it's so much more than that. It's, it's not some compliance thing. It, li it literally comes from your heart. A lot of times, you don't even have any idea how much you're blessing someone else. Sometimes the kids got to see that, and oftentimes they didn't. What we were trying to do is create a culture in our house. Our kids actually began to see how this wasn't just something that dad did because he's cheap. It was something that actually comes from God's word. And they're able to see over time that this is something that actually honors God and it's something they could do. I just passed the CPA exam and my company gave me $300. And we were trying to decide what to do with that. Brand new, just got married out of school and Anna wanted to buy a color TV. A color TV, imagine that. Uh, I, but I said, no, babe, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take that 300 bucks and give it to the three ministers at our church, 100 bucks each. And here's what happened. Right after we did, our, our good friends who lived in our apartment complex 
called us up and said, come over, and they had to tell us this amazing story, how they had prayed that day for $100. God, we have to have 100 bucks. And they had no idea that I'd taken that $300 from the CPA exam and had given that to our church, and we had been the answer to someone else's prayer. It began literally the start of a life of going, you know what, we get money to give it away, and because you never know how you're gonna bless somebody else. Well, that video makes me smile because of the intensity in the eyes of, of Tim Alba, and nobody lives it or believes it more than him, uh, what he shared today. What we're talking about today are principles that, that ought to grip all of us whenever it comes to the aspect of finances. And of course, Jesus made this a key part of what he said in Matthew chapter five, Matthew chapter six. So today we're gonna look at some principles out of the scripture that deal with the whole idea about money being financially wise or being financially faithful. Now the principles I'm gonna give you this morning are what I call supra-cultural principles. That means they tr transcend all cultures and they are just eternal truths that God gives us in his word. They span every age, every dis dispensation, every economic system you and I can possibly imagine, every circumstance in the world. They're not exclusively Old Testament principles and they're not exclusively New Testament principles. They're both and. These are God's principles for those who follow him. Gene Getz, in one of his great books, states those supercultural principles have to fall into several categories. Let me just give them to you very briefly. Those kinds of principles must be determined from the totality of Scripture. They have to be consistent throughout the Bible. Secondly, they're defined within the culture where they're given in practice. And thirdly, interpreted in light of Jesus' plan for the church and his own teaching. Let me give you three principles today. And then we'll get into the text and look at a caution, a command, and a guarantee. All right, are you ready? If you have your note-taking apparatus ready, it's time to put these down because these are keys. Number one, the ownership principle. Here's the ownership principle found all the way through the Scripture. God owns everything. I just manage his money. Are you with me this morning? God owns everything. I simply manage his money. From the moment of creation onward, God has instituted and declared and helped mankind learn that principle. God owns everything. I simply manage his money. Principle number two, the heart principle. My heart is tested by how I manage God's money. By what I do with my finances, what I do with my resources, I can even dive into my own gifts and talents that are non-monetary, non-materialistic. How I manage that, how I use that reflects my heart towards God. And my heart is tested by how I manage God's money. Number three, the priority principle. God expects us to place his agenda first in spending. God expects us to place his agenda first in spending. So those principles should guide everything every believer does when it comes to a paycheck, when it comes to their material things, when it comes to their possessions or their plans. We go by that. Now think about how that impacts us. If God owns everything, as we just heard in the video, then we're simply managers of someone else's money, God's money. Now, that doesn't mean that you only manage someone else's money if you're a money manager in a financial corporation or an investor, but you are really God's manager of the monies that he has given you. So that's an important principle to look at. And then that priority principle, what am I gonna do with all that God has blessed me with? How will I one day give an account for all the many things that God has blessed me with, financial, material, or personal, how am I gonna do that? And what does it say about my heart if I'm not doing that well? So I hope today is a day of conviction. It is for me as I study this. I hope it's a day of illumination because it sheds light on our lives. I hope it's a day of transformation because how we deal with our money before the eyes of God is so incredibly important. It's a day-to-day, everyday thing. Our New Testament believers have testimony and story after story after story in the book of Acts of how they often gave up much in order to feed those that were hungry, in order to minister to those that were in need. And so today, let's look at how we do that as believers. Now, as we get into Matthew chapter 6, first of all, Jesus gives us an important caution about money. As I look at verse 33 of Matthew chapter 6, I have this amazing line that starts with an adversity statement. 
He says, seek first his kingdom. But before he says that, he says, but seek first his kingdom. In other words, this word helps separate the command we're going to look at in just a few moments from the cautions he's given from verse 24 all the way down to verse 33. And those cautions have everything to do with worry and anxiety and overabsorption with money and things material. For example, if we go back to verse 25, notice what he says there. For this reason I say to you, don't be worried about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or what you will put on. Look down in verse 27. And who of you by being worried can add a single hour to his life? Verse 28. And why are you worried about clothing? Verse 29. Not even Solomon in all his glory was clothed like this. If you look down in verse uh, 30, um, 32 and 31 and 32, it says, Don't worry then, saying, What will we eat or what we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek after these things, but your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Five times in that text, the word worry is given. The word worry is a word that means anxiety. It means to be overly concerned about something. It means that we occupy our mind space and our brain energy on thinking about things that we want or believe that we need. It indicates a strong desire for something. I don't think it's hard for us to figure out that when we really seek something, when we really want something, when we really yearn after something, it begins to capture our hearts. And it begins to capture eventually our treasure one way or another. Now, we live in a most materialistic society in the history of the world. So we live in a culture where the norm is to want everything you can possibly want and then to pursue it and seek it in any way you can get it. That's why the United States of America is in debt to the tune of $19.2 trillion. That's our national debt. And I believe that's a direct result of a materialistic mindset, a mindset that says we want what we want now. We're not willing to wait for provision. We're not willing to wait for paying it the right way. We just want it. Credit card debt in the United States of America, $946 billion. The average consumer in America that has a credit card has an average of 3.7 credit cards, an average of $16,000 to $20,000 of debt. And so we're living a life, often, where we want something badly and we go after it even though we don't see the provision for it yet. Uh, I don't know a person in the room that maybe hasn't had that happen to them. I I think we're talking about something that all of us have experienced at some point in life, the need for something, the desire for something, the willingness to do something even when we don't have it. When I was young, I can remember going in stores, electronic stores, Best Buys and stores like that and wanting something so bad because it was the newest, latest invention of whatever cell phone version was out at the time or whatever electronic trinket was there, just wanting it so bad that I would literally shake because I wanted that. I felt like I had to have that. And yet, no matter how I acquired that, if I acquired it, within a few weeks, all the glitter was off of that. And I was wondering why in the world did I pay this amount of money for this little thing? And it's just not worth it anymore. And that's become a way of American life. So what do we do as believers when it comes to looking at all these commands and and, and cautions about being anxious, about worrying about things, about pursuing things? What do we do when it happens to us? The reality is today, even the secular world uh, is making mockery of of how we spend money in America today. Now, I've never really played a Saturday Night Live video Uh, in a worship service, but I'm going to do that this morning for one reason, because it has an incredible message, and it's sarcastic, but man, it makes the point. I want you to watch it for just a second. Well, that was different, wasn't it? But the message is pretty plain. The message is pretty plain. It's almost like a slap in the face of the American consumer, almost a slap in my face or yours. But reality is, the Bible says we don't have to be worried about things that we don't have. God is able to meet our needs. God is able to make the provision that's necessary. But it is a key that we learn to trust him. Dave Ramsey is a, is a Christian author and a Christian conference leader, and, and he goes around the nation and helps people get out of debt. And some of the things that he says make a lot of sense. He says this, for example. He says, act your wage, or debt is dumb. 
But the Bible gives it in a very different term. It says the borrower is a slave to the lender. That's a huge deal. I'm thankful I'm in a church that's debt free. But some of them paid a great price for us to be debt free. I'm thankful when I hear families tell me we're pursuing debt freedom, but, but there's a price to pay for debt freedom. And part of that price is to overcome the whole aspect of anxiety mentioned in Matthew chapter 6. We have to overcome anxiety, the desire for materialism, the desire to have what we want now. And the key to all that is this. We have to come to the place of realizing that those things we think will complete us or make our life a little bit happier for the moment really do not satisfy us in the long run. And here's why. Because you and I, as human beings who follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, are only satisfied by the things of God. Ultimately, only Christ satisfies. Ultimately, only his favor and only his hand in our life really, really makes life worth living. And so Jesus begins this whole discourse in Matthew chapter 6, before getting to verse 33, with this admonition, this caution not to be anxious. And then secondly, a universal command about money. Notice what the rest of verse 33 says. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Now that same kind of seeking that we see used in the word about anxiety is now being used in the word about good things, about righteousness, about his kingdom. We are to earnestly endeavor to find, earnestly to seek him. In Luke chapter 12, verse 29, Jesus says, don't ask what you will eat and what you will drink. Don't keep worrying. Trust that I'll provide for you, Jesus says, and seek me first. You see, when we begin to come to the place of saying, God is the owner of all and provider of all, we go to him instead of any other resource for all that we want or all that we need. So what do we seek? What do we seek? According to Jesus, we seek, first of all, his kingdom, his kingdom. The Bible tells us that the word kingdom means the rule of God, his commands, his precepts, his priorities, his values. The kingdom of God refers to the eternal kingdom that is his. That is on earth in the form of the church and the ministries that bring his name and his gospel out. All through the scripture, these principles that I spoke of a few moments ago say that we are, first of all, to look to God's kingdom and the advancing of his message before we do anything else. In other words, put your money in God's work before you put it out anywhere else. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense to someone that doesn't follow Christ. It doesn't make sense to the person that, that just trying to get through life. But once we come to realize who God is, what he's done, how he owns it all, how he provides for us, it makes complete sense that we come and and give back to him first and foremost. In the Old Testament, when God was helping his people begin to understand what it means to follow him, there's a passage in Exodus chapter 11 I want you to turn to. Exodus, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 13, verse 11. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 11 when God is helping the Israelites realize I'm going to lead you out and I'm going to make you free. He says this in verse 11, Now when the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanites, he swore to you and to your fathers and gives it to you. You shall devote to the Lord the first offspring of every womb, the first offspring of every beast that you own. The males belong to the Lord. But every first offspring of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. But if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And every firstborn of a man among your sons you shall redeem. Now, we look at that text and we say, what is God up to there? But the reality is, if you continue reading, it simply says, when you redeem the firstborn to the Lord, when you give an offering to the Lord for that firstborn, what you're saying is, God, I acknowledge that you have set us free, you provided for us, you've given us a life and a calling, you are our Lord and our master, and we will acknowledge that in everything that you bless us with. In other words, you honor the Lord with everything that you have. Give to God all the top. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, you find it in a general principle way. The wisest man in all the world said this, honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. You know, when God brings you a paycheck, and I know today that having a paycheck from an employer feels a little differently from God providing something in what we would consider a supernatural way, but but God provides supernaturally. He also provides naturally and normally. 
But when that paycheck comes, consider that paycheck does not just come from your employer, but it comes from God's ultimate provision. It's no less supernatural than when someone comes up to you and hands you a $1,000 check out of the blue. God has enabled you to have your gifts and your talents and your wisdom. He's enabled you to be uh, surrounded by people that could help make you successful. He's placed you in a land where there is great provision because he wants you to be his steward. And as you are a manager of God's resources, you come and bring back to him first so that you can say and acknowledge him as owner of all, Lord of all, master of all. And you can seek first his kingdom. You see, when we seek first his kingdom, we're saying, Lord, I recognize that I'm not here on my own for my own purpose. I'm here for you. That's why when we talk about worshiping during our offering time, that's what we mean. We mean we worship God with the fruit of our lips, but we also worship God with the fruit of our paychecks. And as we come back to him, we're saying, Lord, this is not just for the support of a church ministry. And this is not just for the support of missionaries around the world, even though it does that. This is not just for the hungry and the poor and the needy. This is an act of worship. This is how I say literally, physically, materially, financially, you are my Lord, you're my God. Offering times ought to be a time of rejoicing, thankfulness to God that he's provided for us and gratitude that we can give back to him. It's the ability to say, Lord, you are my Lord. And even in these areas of my finances, even when it's difficult or tough financially, I still want to be able to say to you, you are the Lord of my life, and I'm going to give accordingly. So we give first to his kingdom, and we give that because God has called us to do it. And all through the scripture, we have different admonitions. We have the tithe mentioned in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, it says that we are on the first day of the week to set aside according to how you've been prospered. We always teach this. We always teach that the tithe is not the end of all. The tithe is the beginning point of your giving. That's where you begin to give to God. That's where your faithfulness begins. But, but really, in the New Testament era, grace is far more than just satisfying the requirement of a tithe in the Old Testament. And so the heart of it all is to begin there. The only proportion mentioned in the Bible is that of a tithe. So we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, but first of all, by giving first to God, that is financial wisdom as you began. Then secondly, his righteousness. Now, in a context about materialism and things and money, we have seeking God's kingdom first and seeking God's righteousness first. Now, that is just a reference to conforming to all he commands. Seek after God's character in your life, you could read it. Or it's doing what Jesus would do with the money God has blessed us with. Now, I've got to tell you, sometimes that sounds a little corny to say, what would Jesus do with my money if he had it in his hands? But it's a great prayer to pray and a great way to begin to think through your decision-making. Because I have a feeling our, our finances and our spending would be a whole lot different if we began to ask that question. And when I ask that question, I come back to the stewardship issue. The Lord Jesus would be a wise steward of everything his father provided for him. And so we should. That means being a steward and a manager in our mindsets where we sit down and actually ask tough questions, good questions, deep questions about how we use our money. It means being generous. That means not keeping it all for ourselves. It means not turning away the poor because Jesus said the poor you'll always have with you. It means investing in the gospel. It means investing in missions. It means being able to say what we do with our money can have a profound salt light impact on our world. All over the world today, people from all different backgrounds give money to causes they believe are important. There is no more important cause than the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. There is no more important cause than the righteousness of God. So we have a lot to pray over. We have a lot of decisions to make day by day by day when we begin to say, Lord, we're going to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. Financially wise people heed the caution about materialism. They also heed the command about seeking first. And then finally, they believe the guarantee. You know what the guarantee is? The guarantee is at the end of verse 33 of Matthew chapter 6, and all these things shall be added to you. Now, this is not a prescription for a prosperity, but it's a prescription and a promise that says, 
all the things you have need of in your life that everyone else worries about and that you refuse to worry about because you're going to trust God with the priority in your life, God is able to meet those needs so that you don't have to worry about them, you don't have to be anxious about them, you trust him with them, and he will meet that need. Literally, he states that everything you need, food, drink, clothing, and life will be added to us. God will put it to you without your own efforts causing it to happen. When you prioritize your giving before the Lord and your spending before the Lord. Years ago, back in uh, 2004, 2005, 2006, and ultimately 2007, this church was in debt $6.7 million. And something happened called the miracle. The miracle was an opportunity for people to say, we're going to trust God above and beyond what we normally give on a week-by-week -week basis over the course of however long it takes to remove this debt. And what happened was an amazing story. And that amazing story was that over 28 months, the Lord enabled this church not to be worried about debt, but just to prioritize the whole idea of seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. And, and he enabled us to pay off the entirety of that debt in July of 2007. We, we were on the stage. We had a note-burning ceremony, and all the debt was removed. And you can say amen at this moment because that's a great moment. It's a great moment. Praise the Lord for that. But it came about because people were willing to say, that's a high priority in our life. Now, to the best of my knowledge, no one has come back to any of our leaders and said, you know, that was a bad move on my part to be involved with that debt removal. I gave a whole lot of money. I wish I hadn't have done it now. Or I gave a whole lot of money, and now I don't have anything to eat. I don't have a car to drive. I don't have a place to live. To the best of my knowledge, no one came back and said, that was a huge mistake on my part. I, I, I misunderstood completely what I was supposed to be doing, and God has not been faithful. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Today, people talk about that era in our church life as an incredible supernatural era where no matter what they gave, God was able to provide their needs in supernatural ways. Great stories come out of that era. I remember the story of one particular woman who had an oil lease given to her years before, and it wasn't doing that well. And her story is that she began to make a commitment to this debt removal called the miracle and uh, as she began to make that commitment over those 28 months, that oil lease began to increase in value because of oil prices going up. At one point, she called one of the staff members of the church, and here were her words, and I quote, I may have to get me one of them their financial advisors that's doing so well. And she gave, and she gave, and she gave, and she gave because she saw God's hand at work, and she wasn't worried. She wasn't anxious. She didn't get overly consumed about the things in her life. She saw God moving in supernatural ways. Over the course of ministry and life, I've seen God add in so many different ways. I've seen him provide over and over and over. How does he do it? Sometimes God adds to what we already have. Sometimes he just shows us that what we have is enough, and then he adds to that bit by bit. Secondly, he blesses our efforts and more provision results. There are times when you invest in God's kingdom and God's righteousness and unexplainable responses in the material world happen to you that you didn't bring about. Number three, we see God often opening heaven's windows and providing supernaturally. Number four, he meets needs through others so that it costs us nothing and God has a history of doing that through the course of the Bible. Number five, he prevents decay that would naturally happen. Do you remember? The children of Israel walked for 40 years in the wilderness on the same set of shoes, and the soles of their shoes did not wear out. I've seen God rebuke the devourer. I've seen God enable people to continue on without having to have new things because they were faithful to God in the beginning. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added to you, not for the purpose of prosperity, but for the purpose of testimony and furthering of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You and I are managers of God's money, and we want to be financially wise and financially faithful in all that we do. That's what makes the church, the followers of Christ, so different from how everyone else in this world uses their money. Over the last few years, we have devoted incredible numbers of dollars 
in our community, in ministries like MCPC or Kids Beach Club or Six Tones, Apartment Life, Career Solutions, lives are touched that we may never know about. But they were touched because someone said, I'm going to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Is that financial wisdom? Is that financial faithfulness? Absolutely it is. We've supported missionaries all over the world. Someone in a part of the world you've never heard of and a name of a country you can't even say has come to faith in Jesus because someone has been faithful along the way. And believe Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Now I believe that, that when we give to God, and when we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be added to us. But I also believe there's a whole other level of that one day when we die and we stand before God in heaven. And when we hear a story, a testimony, a word, or maybe a whole volume of what God has done with what we've invested in his kingdom and his righteousness, and we see the names and the faces of people that have come to faith in Christ, or lives have been, who's, whose families have been changed, individuals who've been changed, because somewhere we said, Matthew 6, somewhere we said, we'll be financially faithful, we'll be financially wise, and we'll trust God with what he does. Folks, we can change the world by living like disciples of Jesus Christ. We can turn the world upside down by how we live and how we spend. Maybe one of the favorite verses I have when it comes to money is in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. Let me just read this to you today. As Paul writes to the church at Corinth and tells the story of an incredible group of people who were giving above and beyond their own ability. And it says this in verse 5. It says, and this, not as we first expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Paul said this group of people that were seen as incredibly generous people first gave themselves to God and then they gave their offering to us. What an incredible story of wisdom and priority. First we give ourselves to God and then we give through our resources to his kingdom. Let me ask you a question today. As I close this message, have you first given yourself to God? Have you come to say, Lord Jesus, you are literally my Lord and Savior, not just my Savior, but my Lord and Savior. You're my master. You not only rescued me from eternal separation and rescued me from sin, but you also rescued me from myself. And so you're my Savior, but you're also my Lord. Today, I want to trust you. Today, I want to follow you. Today, I want to obey you and be financially wise and faithful with all you've given me. I want you to bow your head for just a moment and close your eyes. In just a few moments, we're going to sing a song that we sung many, many, many times. And it's a song called Trust and Obey. The lines of that song say this, trust and obey, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. I love the words of that song. And over these next few moments, I want to challenge you. In the same way I've challenged you to be passionately committed to Christ, Challenge you to be socially concerned about those around you. I challenge you to be evangelistically bold in this world that needs the gospel so bad. I challenge you to be biblically measured and open the word of God up and let it measure your life. In that same way, I challenge you to be financially faithful to God. It's not just one thing. It's one aspect of your whole life of following Christ. And maybe this morning you need to first give yourself to God. And then you give your resources to him. Father, in Jesus' name today, these next few moments are important moments of reflection and decision and even transformation. Father, today I pray that we will think deeply upon this text, that we are to not worry, but to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. And that we're to believe the promise. All these things be added to us. Lord, today I pray that you will allow us, first of all, to give ourselves to you. And then our resources. Father, thank you for your provision, your love. Thank you for the high calling you placed on our lives. With everything about our lives, including money. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me?